Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. A common theme in many movies is the good guy defeating the bad guy. The hero goes through many struggles and trials, finally vanquishing the villain. Unfortunately, reality is full of triumphant and prosperous villains. Yet it does sometimes happen in real life where after many trials and tribulations, the bad guy is taken down by the underdog. And when such an event happens, history is made and legends are born. And that is what happened in the first decade of the 20th century in the American car industry. The hero defeated the villain in a legendary battle. The battle between Henry Ford and George Selden. If you're not familiar with the early career of Henry Ford or the career of George Selden, go ahead and pause this and check out the VCH episodes on either or both of them. Links are in the description below. Okay, let's move on. George Selden was a patent lawyer who, in 1879, submitted the paperwork to begin the process of patenting the automobile in the USA. He was savvy and wanted to make the patent as inclusive as possible while still standing up in court. Over the next 16 years, he amended the language of the patent until, in 1895, he officially submitted and received the patent for the car. In his patent, a car was defined as a four-wheeled vehicle with an internal combustion engine. Under the U.S. patent laws of the time, his ownership of the idea of the car would be in effect until 1910. Now, there were still ways to get around his patent. A gas-powered car with only three wheels was not covered, as well as motorcycles. Also, cars powered by something else, like a steam engine or an electric motor, were also exempt. But American roads of the time were almost non-existent, which made three-wheeled cars problematic. To go from town to town was to use unpaved wagon trails. And for a three-wheeler, this meant that the center wheel would be running much higher than the others, and also have to deal with grass, weeds, and rocks in the middle of the path. Additionally, the infrastructure to supply and maintain any kind of car were also very scarce outside of the large towns and cities. Despite these obstacles, car manufacturers of all kinds sprang up everywhere in the U.S. during the late 1890s, and there really wasn't much Selden could do about it. Yes, he had managed to patent the idea of a four-wheeled gas-powered car. However, the government was not going to enforce it for him. He would have to do that himself, and George simply did not have the means. He would have to travel all over the country, paying his own expenses, court fees, and whatnot to demand payment from a car manufacturer with court cases that could easily last a year or more. And with dozens of car makers popping up all over the country every month, he did not have the money or time to prosecute his patent. It would take teams of lawyers to do the job that he could not as of yet pay. He was lucky in that a New York maker of electric coaches and taxis, the Electric Vehicle Company, decided to pay him a royalty of $15 for every coach sold in 1897. But they made commercial vehicles and only sold a few months the best. And yes, by the letter of the patent, this company didn't have to pay him since their cars were not powered by an internal combustion engine. There was, however, an ulterior motive. One of the owners of the electrical vehicle company was a Mr. William Collins Whitney, politician, former secretary of the Navy, and very wealthy landowner of much prominence and influence in political circles. He, like Harry Lawson in the UK, wanted to own the monopoly on automobiles in his country. He had already been working on such a plan for electric cars, 
And when he discovered Selden's patent, he came up with a new strategy, buy Selden's patent, and then, with his financial and political might, prosecute it. So, Whitney approached Selden with a very shrewd offer. He would pay George $10,000 cash for the patent, along with 5% royalty on the profits from it. And perhaps most importantly, Selden himself would remain as the man who invented the automobile and would be the figurehead of the operation. This arrangement suited them both. George would finally have some money and still get credit for his patent in the public eye. Whitney, in turn, could continue his personal plan of dominating the American auto industry, yet keep his name out of the fray in order to protect his political career. Thus, in 1900, using the electric vehicle company as a platform, Whitney, under Selden's name, began to enforce the patent. The first target was Alexander Winton. By 1900, the Winton Motor Carriage Company was the largest manufacturer of cars in the United States. Alexander himself was a bit of a brittle man, and when the patent suit was filed against him, his attitude was basically to tell the Seldonites to get stuffed. He believed that the patent was not enforceable, and as such directed his lawyers to challenge it with the legal tactic called a demurrer. In simplest terms, a demurrer defense is a snub at the plaintiff, claiming that the case has no merit and should be just thrown out of court. Unfortunately, Whitney had plenty of money and lawyers at his disposal, and after two years of litigation, there was still no end in sight. This was costing Winton a lot of money, and the drain to his coffers was beginning to seriously impact his business. Some of his associates in the industry did try to help him out with the legal defense, but Whitney's financial might behind the Selden patent was formidable. Whitney and Selden reorganized their business in early 1903, naming it the Association of Licensed Automobile Manufacturers, or ALM. And only a matter of weeks afterwards, Winton capitulated and joined their organization, thus agreeing to pay the royalties. Alum and the Selden patent had just become legitimate, yet it was still untested in court. Alum dropped their case against Winton, and with such a large company joining the group, others very quickly followed. Packard, Peerless, Studebaker, Cadillac, Oldsmobile also signed on as the royalty that the association charged on production, which was set to one and one quarter of a percent of gross profits, was far cheaper to pay than the court cost to fight the patent. Alum itself established a five-member panel to examine the companies seeking to join their group, and it required a unanimous agreement from all five to allow an applicant their license to build cars in the USA. Of course, both Whitney and Selden were members of this board. Having quite literally taken the reins of the American automotive industry, they were in a position to direct the development of car makers in the United States. By the autumn of 1903, five men were, quite literally, the American automotive Illuminati. If you wanted to make cars in the U.S., you had to play by their rules. Their rules were clear. Large touring and luxury cars were expensive and much sought after by the wealthy European elite. And, since Alum made money per car produced, Americans needed to make cars that were the most profitable. If you do not, then the legal might of the Illuminati will fall upon you and destroy you. With all that said, let's talk about their opponent, Henry Ford. Now, Alum knew of Ford since his time running the Detroit Motor Company. Ford had established this company in 1899 with the help of his group of financial backers, but failed after a year and a half. He built some race cars during this time, but didn't make much money, and for the moment it would seem that this young upstart was done. Yet he was able to find some more investors and reorganize the company a month later. This would be the first to be called by his name, the Henry Ford Company. Using the same facility, 
he would continue to promote racing, but would also be working on his own personal project, a car for the masses. The idea for what would eventually become the Model T dates to this era, though it would be many years and a new company later before that legendary car would begin manufacture. The Henry Ford Company lasted but six months before the money pulled out. The remains were reorganized under the direction of Henry Leland, who would establish Cadillac. Undaunted, Ford would partner up with a new group of friends and, in 1903, establish the company that still exists today, the Ford Motor Company. With Ford now free to seek his dream of making a car for the masses and the money to do it backing him up, Henry established a new factory in Detroit to build the first of his economy cars, the Model A. A simple runabout, it was an eight horsepower machine with a twin cylinder engine with opposed cylinders, similar to a beaver engine, two speed transmission, and weighing in at about 1,250 pounds, it cost brand new some $850. A lot of money, but was a step in the right direction. But Ford knew that if he went into full production without being a member of Alem, it would be a serious problem. So he approached them and made the request to join and pay the royalties. Now, Alem had a new member, Henry Leland from Cadillac. From this, they knew that the Cadillac company was built from the bones and ashes of the previous two companies Ford tried to establish. They also knew what Ford really wanted to do, make cheap cars and Alum will not get much money per car if they're cheap. So they rejected his application. In other words, they told Henry Ford he could not build cars in the United States. This was no small matter. Keep in mind that Alum was not limited to going after car manufacturers that did not comply with them, but owners as well. Indeed, if you purchased a car in the United States and it did not have the brass plaque on it declaring that it was built by an Alem member and compliant with the Selden patent, Alem could hunt down the owner and take legal action against them personally for owning and operating a non-compliant vehicle. And they did exactly that. Alem filed suit against Ford in 1903 and also publicly promised to anyone that bought a Ford that they would find them and sue them. In the first decade of the 20th century, the public was quite terrified of this group, and public opinion about such monopolies became quite sour. And Ford decided to fight. When the Ford Motor Company received notice of the suit against them, they released a press statement that included the following, quote, so far as our plan of action is concerned for the future, it's extremely simple. We intend to manufacture and sell all the gasoline automobiles of the type we are constructing that we can. We regard the claims made by the Selden patent as covering the monopoly of such machines as entirely unwarranted. We possess just enough of that instinct of American freedom to cause us to rebel against oppression or unfair competition, end quote. They even promised to cover the court costs of any Ford customers that Alem tried to hunt down. This was a true David versus Goliath battle. By 1905, Alem was a $70 million concern, while Ford Motor Company was barely worth a hundred grand. However, Ford, like David, gathered three smooth stones in his sling. First, he had some influential friends, Thomas Edison being amongst them, and these friends were willing to help in the fight. Second, the French firm Panhard and Levisor had begun to sell cars in the U.S and joined in on Ford's side to challenge it, as they were also dealing with Alem in not a very friendly manner. And third, Ford understood marketing and public relations, something that the bullying Illuminati believed themselves to be above. And so, the battle began. The first round lasted some six years, with Judge Charles Howe presiding over the case. The principal argument presented by Alem was that Selden's patent was first submitted in 1879. 
Though it was not effective until 1895, the date is clear. He invented the car, since no cars were built in the U.S. or anywhere else prior to that point. Ford's friends and lawyers contended that what Alem had created was a monopoly of the industry, which itself violated the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Alem countered this by pointing out that Alem was not a manufacturer, but was rather a consortium of many individual and independent car makers, and as such was not a monopoly. This case happened during the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, who himself was a very anti-monopoly kind of guy. The political and social environment of the time was actually against Whitney, Selden, and Alem, and thus Ford and his friends put their pens to paper to create a media campaign to discredit Alem and bring public and executive opinion on their side. Magazine articles, letters to the editor, and court reports began to flood into the media, lauding the efforts of Ford against the tyrant known as Selden. Through these public relation efforts, Ford was no longer viewed as just another car company, but as a person and a hero. Ford was depicted as defending the rights of all Americans to have the freedom to choose, and the common man in the streets began to root for Ford to win the case. And in 1909, he lost the case. Judge Howe ruled that although the official patent date was 1895, Selden did his initial filing in 1879, and that date would make him the inventor of the car, thus the patent stands. This would appear to be the end. I mean, even General Motors joined Adelham at that point. Ford was done, but he was not. Ford immediately filed for an appeal, which would be heard by Judge Walter Noyes of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. There was another patent case going on at this time, and the Ford friends and lawyers believed that it would be key to win on appeal. That case was regarding the 1906 patent issued to Orville and Wilbur Wright on the airplane. Their legal team had brought suit against Glenn Curtis for making airplanes, despite the fact that Curtis's plane was radically different than the Wright Flyer. Though the case was still in process, the arguments that Curtis's legal team brought to the court were powerful. The airplane is an idea. How you execute the idea can be patented, but not the idea itself. For example, aircraft have wings. So do birds, bats, and bugs. So if you come up with a new kind of wing, go ahead and patent it. But you can't, in the same patent, now own the concept of a wing unless you plan to sue all the various critters that fly around using them. Ford's team took this route, claiming that Selden did not own the idea of a car. They specifically pointed out that Selden's patent for the car was powered by a Brayton cycle engine, which was technically an internal combustion engine, but absolutely nothing like the four-stroke auto engines that were powering cars, including Ford's. The judge agreed, and on January 9, 1911, Ford won on appeal, with Judge Noyes declaring in his decision that no car maker, including Ford, owes seldom or Alem anything. Ford was celebrated across the country as the David that slew Goliath. Sales of his cars soared, and Henry Ford himself became, for a time, a national hero. Legislation began to change and patent law reforms were enacted. Car makers began to share their various patents with one another for mutual benefit, which is still done to this day. The American automotive industry was freed from Alem's shackles and the organization itself was abandoned, ceasing to exist within a few months. But what happened to George Selden? There's another common movie plot where someone down on his luck sells his soul to the devil, making his dreams come true, but at a massive price. Selden sold his soul to a local devil, William Whitney, and Whitney gave him what he wanted, fame and fortune, for a time. But in the end, George Selden became impoverished and infamous, a man hated by his own countrymen. While Whitney... The mastermind behind it all silently laughed his way to the bank.
Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.